When it comes to diseases that are caused by fear, anxiety and stress, antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs and tranquilizers are not the answer. These are neurological blockers and calming agents that have extremely dangerous side effects and some are addictive. I've explained previously that drugs are just a form of disease management. They dull the symptoms instead of dealing with the root of the problem. Furthermore, antidepressants, tranquilizers and anti-anxiety drugs are a poor substitute for the peace of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Your Heavenly Father doesn't want you chemically manipulated and artificially maintained by drugs for the rest of your life. He wants you to have an abundant life with peace spiritually, emotionally and physically. He wants you totally healed of your disease and for you to have complete freedom from anxiety and fear because he didn't give these things to you. Psalm 34 verse 4 says that the Lord wants to deliver you of all of your fears. I've explained previously that there are two main types of fear that we deal with. There are the superficial fears, for example worrying about the future, such as not having enough money. We may worry about passing an exam or we may stress about meeting a deadline at work. Then there are the much deeper fears that come from a breach in relationships and a broken heart. Fear of man, fear of failure, fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear of being vulnerable or trusting somebody again and so forth. We are seeing the more serious illnesses come from this type of fear. Most fear, anxiety and stress and disease is not fear of flying or fear of snakes, it is relationship breakdowns. Let's first discuss the superficial fears. As I talk about worry and anxiety in the next half hour, I'd like to encourage you to begin to think about and identify those issues in your life that are robbing you of your peace. What is it that happened that put that fear inside you? What is it that stresses you out internally? What are you perpetually anxious about? I have met people that seem addicted to worrying. If they don't have something of their own to worry about, they'll imagine and worry about something that could happen, or they will even worry about somebody else's problem. The devil attempts to steal your valuable time and your life in many ways, and one of them is through worry and anxiety. Thoughts of fear, anxiety and worry are what the devil uses to distract you from using your powerful mind for the purpose which God designed it. There are certain things that God instructs you to do with your mind. For example, in Joshua 1 verse 8, God said, This book of the law will not depart of your, out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will deal wisely and have good success. When you start to think like God because you're meditating on God's Word, your health and every other area of your life will prosper. So the devil wants to keep you me mentally busy with worrying so that this never gets done. Anxiety and worry are a useless waste of time that we should have been using to serve God. God doesn't ask us to serve Him for His ben benefit. He is Almighty God and He doesn't need our help with anything. He asks us to serve Him because it is for our own good. As we walk in obedience to God, He intends our life to be of such high quality 
that we enjoy it tremendously. Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have and enjoy life, and have it in abundance, to the full, until it overflows. If you truly want to get well, you have got to be prepared to eradicate fear, anxiety, worry and stress from your thought life. You have got to learn to trust God and get into a habit of casting your cares on Him. In 1 Peter 5 verse 7 in the Amplified Bible it says, Cast the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on Him, for He cares about you affectionately and He cares about you watchfully. Kenneth Hagen told the story of a lady who came to him at the close of a service after he had just preached. She said to him, Pastor, I want you to agree with me in prayer about something. The cares and worries of this life are just too heavy and I can't bear them. With that she began to cry. She then went on to say in sincerity, I want you to pray that either God will give me grace to bear them or else take about half of them away. I can carry about half of them, but I can't carry all of them. So he opened his Bible to 1 Peter 5 verse 7 and he asked her to read it out loud. Then he said, I can't pray that God would give you grace to bear your cares and worries. He doesn't want you to bear them. I can't pray that God will take away even half of them. He doesn't want you to carry even half of them. He wants you to cast all of your cares, once and for all, on Him. And she said, I can't do it. And Kenneth Hagin said to her, God is not telling you to do something that you can't do. He would be an unjust God to do that. You've been praying about this for years and you have never gotten an answer. That is not the way to solve this problem. You solve it by doing what God said to do. And she said, but you don't understand what I've got to worry about. And he replied, but God does. He knows, he understands, and he cares about you affectionately, and he cares about you watchfully. He said to cast all of your cares on him. Whatever the Lord asks of you, he gives you the power to do. As a child of God, by his grace, you can literally come to the place where you don't have a care or worry in the world. It's not that no cares or problems exist, because they do, but the difference is that God has them. God does not promise that you will never have any problems in life, but He does promise that He will faithfully take care of you and deliver you out of every difficult circumstance. Remember Psalm 34 verse 19 says that many are the afflictions and evils that confront the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. What does it practically mean to cast your care to the Lord? Well, if you look up the word cast in the dictionary, it means to pitch or throw. So you can pitch or throw your problems to God, and believe me, He can catch them. And He knows exactly what to do with them. If you are a person who has long-term fear and anxiety in your thought life, I want to encourage you to do a little exercise. Write down on a piece of paper, all the issues, people or problems in your life that are stressing you and getting you fearful and anxious. Then come before God in sincerity and pray something like this. Father, I have this in this problem and I hand it over, cast and completely surrender it to you. And I ask you to take care of it and sort it out. If there is any part that I have to play, please show me. I ask you to give me wisdom and I believe that according to James 1.5, you have given it to me liberally without finding reproach. I do not know how you are going to sort it out, Lord, but I am making the decision to confidently trust in, lean and rely on you with all my heart and with all of my mind. I am not going to rely on my own insight or understanding. I give these problems to you once and for all. And I thank you that I don't have to worry about or be anxious about them anymore. Father, it's in your hands. Then scrunch up that piece of paper with the list of all your problems on it and throw it into the fire or the dustbin or wherever as a symbol of casting your keys to God. Then it is finished. 
You need not worry, stress, be anxious, or fearful about those problems ever again. They are now in God's hands. When the devil brings a picture of the problem to your mind, you say, Yes, I had that problem, but the Lord has it now. Thank you, Lord, that you are taking care of it. Now, if you cast your care or your burden to the Lord, then He has it, you don't. But if you are going to continue to stress and worry about it, if you are going to allow your mind to race around in a panic, trying to find a solution to your situation, if you are still going to try to figure out how the Lord should sort it out, you are nullifying the effects of your praying, and He doesn't have any of your cares, you do. And when you've got it, He can do nothing about it. It's amazing what the Lord can do with your problems when He has them. But as long as you hold on to them by continuing to stress, fear and worry about the problem, as long as you try to figure out how He should solve them, or try to help Him work it out, He doesn't have any of your cares. You do. Joyce Meyer says, You may not know how it's going to work out, but sometimes you just have to be satisfied with knowing the one who knows. You may have never thought of it this way, but when you worry, you have a pride problem. A person who worries somehow thinks that he can solve his problems better than God can. To not worry is to humble yourself before God. The proud man is full of himself. The humble man is full of God. The proud man worries. The humble man leans on and depends on God. You need to do your part in a trial, but do not try to do God's part because the load is too heavy to bear and if you're not careful, you're going to break under the weight of it. Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7 says, Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to the Lord, and God's peace, which transcends all understanding, will garrison and mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There is another fear that I haven't mentioned yet. This is somebody who works so hard, but they never get anywhere. They take two steps forward and then fall three steps back. It is like trying to fill a bag with sand that has lots of holes at the bottom. That person has a fear of poverty. If you are anxious about your finances or material things, you are trusting in your money and possessions more than you are trusting in the living God. Jesus gave a teaching about fear and anxiety in Matthew chapter 6. It is worthwhile to look at what he had to say. Let's start with verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. He will stand by one and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever is trusted in. Therefore I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious and worried about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or, what, or about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life greater in quality than food, and the body far above and more excellent than clothing? Jesus said here that there is nothing in life that you are to be worried and anxious about, not a single thing. The great quality of life that God has provided for you includes all of those things as well as things that are far more meaningful. In verse 26, Jesus went on to say, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding you. Are you not worth much more than they? Bird watching may not be your favorite pastime, but I encourage you to take some time to sit and observe them. They literally do not know where their next meal is coming from yet. But have you ever seen a bird sitting on a branch in a tree having a panic attack about it? Jesus is simply pointing out here, are you not worth far much more than a bird? Even if you have a low self-esteem, I'm sure that you consider yourself and your life more valuable than a bird. And see how faithfully your Heavenly Father takes care of them. He spared nothing for you, not even His only Son. 
So if you were that valuable to him, surely he is going to look after you better than the bird. In verse 27, Jesus went on to say, And who of you by worrying and being anxious can add one unit of measure to his stature or to the span of his life? In other words, Jesus is saying, How is worrying and being anxious going to change or resolve the situation that is stressing you out? It won't. Worry and anxiety are a useless waste of time. So then what is the point of worrying? It will not help your situation at all. It will only hinder your progress. Carrying on with verse 28. And why should you be anxious about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field and learn thoroughly how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his magnificence, excellence, dignity, and grace, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is alive and green, and tomorrow is tossed into the furnace, will he not much more surely clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry or be anxious, saying, What am I going to eat? Or what am I going to have to drink? Or what am I going to have to wear? Remember that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So thoughts of worry and anxiety are going to translate into words. And your words are very important. They shape your world. The power of life and death is in your words. Fearful words are going to have a tremendous adverse impact on your life and health. Continuing with verse 32. For the Gentiles, in other words those who do not know God, wish for and crave and diligently seek all of these things and your heavenly father knows well that you need them all but seek aim at and strive after first of all his kingdom and his righteousness his way of doing and being right and all these things taken together will be given to you besides so do not worry or be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will have worries and anxieties of its own sufficient for each day is its own trouble. Jesus knew how destructive worry can be to your life and health, so he commanded you not to worry. It wasn't a suggestion. Instead, he calls you to look to God's sure and faithful provision. I wasted a lot of my university days stressing and being extremely worried and anxious about how I was going to study the large volume of work and pass the exams. I used to waste evenings counting the pages and sitting with my calculator working out the hours I had left to study. And the more I would do this, the more wound up I would get. In a way, I would have liked to have those years back so I could approach them in a different way. But once you have wasted the time God has given you, you can't take it back. I look back now and I realize that I wasted all of that time stressing. Instead of using it as a gift from God and just enjoying each day, I gave it to the devil by worrying. God is faithful. He never let me down one time. He always made a way for me. He always gave me the grace and wisdom I needed for each exam. I could have just enjoyed each day, cast my care to the Lord, and not wasted time worrying about how I was going to do it. But instead I allowed my time at university to be one big stressful event. We need to value each day as a gift from God. If we waste it worrying, it is time wasted that can never be taken back. So let's use, learn to use our time as God intended. Life will be far more enjoyable. Life is to be lived today. There is no point in worrying about tomorrow. You have enough to deal with today and that requires your full attention. God has given you grace to handle whatever you have to do today. Tomorrow's grace will not come until tomorrow. So don't waste today. Take this promise to heart. Psalm 37 verse 3 to 5 and verse 7. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident in the Lord. Feed surely on His faithfulness, and truly you shall be fed. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, roll and repose each care of your load on him. Trust, lean on, 
Rely on and be confident also in Him and He will bring it to pass. Be still and rest in the Lord. Wait for Him and patiently lean yourself upon Him. If you want to be free of fear, anxiety and stress, do what that scripture says. True peace comes from God, not from Prozac, yoga or transcendental meditation. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a child is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he paid a very high price to give you a life of peace, regardless of your outward circumstances. The peace that Jesus gives is very different to the world's idea of peace. According to the world, peace is when there is no problems in life. But that is a deception. If you are waiting to, to, until the day you have nothing to worry about before you stop worrying, that time will probably never come. God doesn't promise you a carefree life of bubbles, honey and a bed of roses. Once again it's worth repeating. The Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. You may not be able to change this, your circumstances that are causing the stress and fear in your life, but you can change the way that you react to them. You can have inward peace even though the situations around you are in absolute turmoil. Jesus did not come to remove the storms from our lives. His rest and His peace is one that operates in the midst of the storm, not in its absence. Jesus said in John 14 verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it, let it be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed, and do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated, intimidated and cowardly. There are not many things that the Bible tells us to seek. Firstly, it tells us to seek God, but it also tells us to seek peace. Peace doesn't just fall upon you. You've got to seek it. And do you know what seek means? It means that you go after it with everything you've got. You've got to want it bad. And if you want it bad enough, you'll make a determined decision not to let yourself worry, panic or fear about anything. But in every circumstance, you cast your cares to the Lord. Once you have cast your care on the Lord, you have got to trust Him completely with the outcome and results. In Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6 it says, Lean on, trust in and be confident in the Lord with all of your heart and mind and do not rely on your own insight and understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct and make straight and plain your paths. Releasing that problem and making the decision to trust in God may initially feel very difficult. It is a feeling of loss of control, like stepping out of an aeroplane without a parachute into thin air. But when you lose control and allow God to be in control of your life, and you step into thin air, you're going to land on a very solid foundation. When you step into thin air in faith and make the decision to trust in Him, the Lord will always be faithful to catch you. He will never, ever let you down. The following scripture is a wonderful scripture to quote to yourself when you feel a panic attack coming on. I wrote the scripture on a piece of paper and stuck it on the steering wheel of my car until I got, I got it drummed into me. And that's Hebrews 13, verse 5 to 6, which is a promise that just blows me away. God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not. Note in the Amplified Bible, it really does say, I will not, three times. God said, I will not, I will not, I will not, in any degree, leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you? Assuredly not. So we can take comfort and be encouraged and confidently and boldly say, 
The Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. This is an excellent scripture to use to encourage yourself when you find yourself being concerned about whether or not God will come through for you and meet your needs. If you are a warrior, I encourage you to make the effort to memorize the scripture off by heart. I strongly recommend that you speak out the word when you feel a worry or panic attack coming on. The easiest way to interrupt a thought is to start speaking. You can't say one thing while thinking another thing in your mind at the same time. Also, the power of the Word of God is only released in your life when you speak it. Now, the flesh can get lazy when it comes to learning the Word and speaking out the Word of God to counter a worry attack when it comes. But here is the bottom line. Do you want to overcome your habit of worrying and enjoy good health or not? God has given you His Word, so use it. The Word of God that is spoken from your mouth, with faith to back it up, is the single most effective weapon that can be used to win the battle against worry and anxiety. Let me put it to you this way. The secret to defeating fear and anxiety in your life is right beneath your nose. It might not always feel like God is there, but He very clearly promised in Hebrews 13 verse 5 that He will not, He will not, He will not ever let you down or forsake you or leave you helpless. So say this with me. God's Word says it. I believe it. That settles it. The big question is, do you believe the God of the Bible or the God of your feelings? You cannot allow how you feel to override what the Word of God says, because there is no authority that is higher than the authority of God's Word. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 138 verse 2 that God placed His Word above His name. We can be more sure of God's Word than we can be sure of the fact that the sun will rise tomorrow. In Luke 16 verse 17 it says, It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law, in other words, the Word of God, to fail or become void. So the Word must have final authority in our lives, especially our thought life. We need to bring every fearful, anxious thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Settle it in your heart once and for all. God will never leave you or forsake you. He will never leave you helpless in your problems. He is with you wherever you go. In Joshua 1 verse 9 it says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong, vigorous, and very courageous. Do not be afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So far we have addressed the superficial fears. To overcome worry and anxiety, you need to develop a habit of casting your cares to the Lord in every situation. But what about the deeper fears that come from relationship breakdowns? I spoke about this in session three and I'm going to repeat myself here because it's an important concept. The Bible gives us insight into this deeper type of fear in 1 John 4 verse 18. It says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. There are four parts to the scripture and we need to look at each one. Firstly, there is no fear in love. So think with me through this again. If we have not been loved, covered, nurtured, forgiven, accepted, if we have been verbally abused, emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, or if we have been humiliated or victimized, or we are driven and into perfectionism because we are loved and accepted based on our performance, do you think fear is at our door? Oh yes, you think about it. You are afraid of people you don't feel safe with. You avoid them, don't you? And then we get caught up in worrying about if we're going to fail somebody's expectations. Is somebody going to like us or not like us? We are fearful about what others think about us. Do we measure up? There is no fear in love, so if you are not being loved perfectly, there is fear that is lurking at your door. 
But that fear doesn't come to you and say, I am fear, I'm going to get you. That fear comes with feelings. It comes with impressions. It comes with feelings of insecurity, not feeling safe. Projection about thing, projections about things that could go wrong in the future. Phobias. And you're about to develop a disease because your body's about to respond to your lack of peace. Competition, performance, drivenness, win at all cost. These things are major disease makers. In 1 John 4.18 it says that there is no fear in love. So if we have not been loved perfectly, and we have not been nurtured, loved and accepted, there is a potential for fear to come into our lives. Until you have been delivered of that fear, and you renew your mind with the Word of God, that fear will stay with you for the rest of your life, and it will interfere with all of your relationships. It won't let you give and receive love. Some of you back off and you say, I'll never allow myself to be vulnerable again. I'll just withdraw inwardly and put up a wall of protection for myself. Nobody is ever going to hurt me again. And now you wonder why you have a disease. Satan and his kingdom know exactly what they are doing. When you have unresolved fear at this level, the enemy through the mind-body connection is releasing excessive quantities of the stress hormone cortisol that is damaging almost every organ system in your body. The second part of 1 John 4.18 is perfect love casts out fear. If you want to defeat diseases that are caused by fear, you are going to have to be prepared to receive love again. You are going to have to be prepared to have your fears driven out. You need to be willing to have your mind renewed by changing your thinking. The antidote, the antidote to fear is love. We're going to talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. The third part of 1 John 4 verse 18 is fear has torment. If you have fear, you are tormented. If you have peace, you have no torment. It is that fear that has torment that is the foundation of most psychiatric diseases such as paranoid schizophrenia, psychosis, mania in bipolar disorder, phobias, panic attacks and many anxiety disorders. It is a tormenting hell between the ears and in the depths of the heart. The fourth part of 1 John 4 verse 18 is he who fears is not made perfect in love. If you have fear, you have not been made perfect in love. This means that you have fear because you have a breach somewhere in your relationships. It could be a breach in relationship between you and God. It could be a breach in relationship between you and yourself because you are holding yourself guilty and you won't forgive yourself for what you did in 1963. It may be a breach between you and another person. It could be anybody who was supposed to love you, but didn't. Who did not cover you with love and acceptance. Who did not nurture you, hug you and kiss you. Who didn't forgive you and cover your weaknesses. Who drove you and made you attempt to be perfect. This means that you don't feel safe in love and in relationships. And you are unable to give and receive love without fear. The fear that comes from broken relationships is the fear that is the foundation of over a hundred incurable diseases. And that fear is going to stay there until you are delivered from it with perfect love that casts out fear. The antidote to these deep fears coming from broken relationships is to receive perfect love, which is the love of the Father. Let's read the whole of 1 John 4 verse 18 again. There is no fear in love, but love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. This is the foundation of healing from all fear, anxiety and stress-related diseases, including the deeper fears that come from broken relationships, and that's to receive the Father's love. Perfect love which can only come from the Father, casts out all fear. Love is the antidote to all fear. And it starts with an intimate relationship and fellowship with God the Father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Let's have a look at 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. 
For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We all know this scripture quite well, but I'd like to share with you a deeper insight into what it means. Power represents the Holy Spirit. Love represents the love of the Father. 1 John 4 verse 18 says that God is love. How do you get a sound mind? By the washing of the water of the word, according to Ephesians 5 verse 26. Now who is the word? Well, John 1 verse 1 tells us that Jesus is the word. So power represents the Holy Spirit. Love represents God. And a sound mind represents the word, which is Jesus. So what is the antidote to fear? Fellowship and a love relationship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you're hanging out with God, fear has no chance of taking a root in you. Let's have a look at Romans 8 verse 15. For the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more into a bondage of fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship, in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father, Father. Abba means Daddy. You are adopted and you are now a son and daughter of God, and you get to call the Almighty God, who is the greatest of all, your Daddy, Abba, Father. And your Father wants you to know Him. The more you get to know Him, the more you will love Him. The primary reason that Jesus died was to restore you back into a love relationship with God the Father. You may have been attending church for years, but you still do not know Him. And the only way you are going to get to know Him is to spend time with Him. I'm not talking about five minutes here and there. I'm talking about getting serious. I'm talking about setting aside a decent amount of time every single day to just sit at your father's feet and fellowship with him. This involves talking to him, listening for his voice, speaking to you in your heart, and getting to know him through reading his word, and also through worshiping him in that quiet place where it is just you and him. I've said this previously, but I'll repeat it again because it is so vital. Your time with God is a vital necessity. Like your heartbeat or oxygen in your lungs, you simply cannot live without it. You cannot be the victorious overcomer that God intended you to be, which includes living in divine health if you never spend time with your Heavenly Father. Well, what is a decent amount of time with God? Well, that's up to you. It depends on how serious you are. You will get to know the Father as much as you want to know Him. Every great man and woman of God that I know about who has impacted nations with worldwide ministries such as Smith Wigglesworth, John Wesley, Angus Buckham, Joyce Meyer all spend more than two hours with God every day. Joyce Meyer must have written over 60 books and she does conferences all over the world but she still has time to spend more than two hours with God every day. Oh, there is no way that I would ever have that amount of time to spend with God. Well, you are too busy. Busy people are stressed and anxious people. Angus Buckham defines the word busy like this, burdened under Satan's yoke. Now, I don't want to make a law out of two hours. You spend the amount of time with God that the Holy Spirit leads you to. But my point is that if you are too busy to spend time with God, there are things that you are doing that God hasn't called you to do and those things are a burden that is draining all your energy and sucking the life out of you. So get out the pruning shears and get rid of those things that are robbing you of your time with God. Peace is not something that can be put on you. Galatians 5 verse 22 tells you that, is, that peace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said in John 15 verse 5 that the only way that you are going to see the fruit of the Holy Spirit manifested in your life is by abiding in the vine. That means spending time with Him in intimate fellowship. Do you have a difficulty in trusting people? Do you have difficulty in giving and receiving love without fear? If you do, 
you have fear in you and you need to get to know the Father. In Exodus 33 verse 13 to 14 it says, Show me your ways that I may know you and progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with you, perceiving and recognizing and understanding you more strongly and more clearly. And the Lord said, My presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. The answer to eradicating fear from your life is intimacy with the Father because He wants you to enter His rest. Hebrews 4 verse 3 says, For we who have believed, adhered to, trusted in and relied on God do enter that rest. All spiritually rooted diseases that involve fear involves a separation or breach in relationship with God, yourself or others. Therefore, the beginning of healing is reconciliation with God, learning to receive His love and reconciliation with Him as your Father. Then reconciliation with, of, of you with yourself. Forgive yourself for those things that you are holding yourself guilty for and establish your identity and sense of self-worth in who you are in Christ. Lastly, reconciliation of you with others. Part of your healing begins with learning to trust again and to be vulnerable. People with diseases rooted in fear don't want to be vulnerable because they don't want to take the risk of more rejection. They withdraw into a world of protective mechanisms. They are afraid to be vulnerable because they don't want to get trashed again. Could you dare be vulnerable again? Could you dare believe? Could you dare love again? Yes, by getting to know the Father more and by receiving His love, His perfect love that casts out fear. In Ephesians 3 verse 14 to 19, there is a prayer that is the prayer of my heart for you and I encourage you to take this to your heart this day. I bow my knee before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, the Father from whom all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name. May He grant you out of the rich treasury of His glory to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power in your inner man by the Holy Spirit, Himself indwelling in your innermost being and personality. May Christ through your faith actually dwell, settle down, abide, and make His permanent home in your heart. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love. What is the breadth and length and height and depth of it, that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourself the love of Christ which surpasses mere knowledge without experience that you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God and may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself let's summarize how diseases develop as a result of fear anxiety and stress through the spirit-mind-body connection. Remember I spoke about the source or origin of your thoughts. Who taught you? Who taught you to be full of fear? Who taught you to worry? The spirit of fear. It is important that you understand that fear is not just an emotion. According to 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, it says that fear is also an evil spirit. The spirit of fear gave you thoughts in the first person via theta brainwave activity. For example, I am never going to trust anybody ever again. I am going to withdraw behind my mask of protective mechanisms so that nobody will ever be able to hurt me again. The spirit of fear tempts you to worry with thoughts and feelings. You begin to have flashes about, yes, this could go wrong. I might not have enough money. What if this happens? What if that happens? I am so worried. You don't even realize that those, where those thoughts are coming from. You think that they are your thoughts and feelings. 
you begin to meditate on those thoughts which you think are yours and you start to get worked up, tense, anxious, fearful and stressed in your mind which is your soul. Your enemy is busy training you in your thought life to worry and to be afraid to give and receive love in relationships. As you meditated on those anxious and fearful thoughts in your soul which is your mind, you built a toxic thorn tree of fear in your brain. As you fell into agreement with those thoughts, you became one with them physically in the form of long-term memory, and that toxic thorn tree of fear and anxiety made you sick. So that fear, which was initially spiritual, became a part of you physically in the form of long-term memory. You became one with fear in spirit, soul, and body. Now healing occurs by the same pathway, which is sanctification of the spirit, sanctification of the soul, and then sanctification of the body. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification means a cleansing or a getting rid of filth, in other words, getting rid of sin. So we need to start with sanctification of the spirit. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If you have a spirit of fear, it is an unclean spirit by its fallen nature, so you need to cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the spirit. In other words, you need to get rid of the, the spirit of fear. You need to command it to leave in the name of Jesus because it no longer has a legal right to your life if you have repented. That is sanctification of the Spirit. After sanctification of the Spirit, we need to sanctify our soul through the washing of the water of the Word. You need to renew your mind, which is to change your thinking, by purposely meditating on the Word of God. Repentance is the condition for healing. So to get well from diseases rooted in fear, anxiety and worry, we need to repent to God. We need to ask Him for forgiveness for not being a doer of the Word. And when you repent, remember you need to repent from the heart. However, that prayer of repentance is not the beginning and end of it. That is just the beginning. You still have to go through the process of renewing your mind. Repentance is more than just saying sorry God with words. Repentance means changing your thinking and renewing your mind in the area of sin that caused your disease. So if you have a disease caused by fear, anxiety, worry and stress, you need to renew your mind and change your thinking in this area. A practical suggestion to help you in this process of renewing your mind is a 10 or 15 minute thinking time every day. This is where you take 10 or 15 minutes to just sit down and do nothing else but meditate on scriptures from the Word in the area you need to renew your mind. A thinking time is my prescription for you to get well from incurable disease without any medication whatsoever and also to prevent disease in your life. Why would I advise you to set aside a time every single day where you just sit and meditate on the Word? Because when you are purposefully thinking on the Word of God, you are building lush trees in your brain. Those lush trees are going to produce chemicals that will flow through those thorn trees of fear, anxiety and worry in your brain and it will remove those thorns so that they can no longer release toxic chemicals that make you sick. You will be replacing those toxic memories with good, healthy memories that are built from meditating on the Word of God. Those good, healthy memories, which are like lush trees, will produce healthy chemicals that will flow throughout your whole body and bring healing. That is sanctification of the body, which, which means removal of disease and everything that destroys it. So now you have sanctification of the spirit, soul and body, and that is true wholeness. I must emphasize to you again that healing is not a one-way street where you just sit back and expect God to do it all. You have a part to play in your healing, and that is to renew your mind. 
You need to break those toxic thinking habits of fear and anxiety and develop a new thinking habit of casting your cares. You are the only one who can renew your mind. Nobody else can do it for you and God is certainly not going to do it for you either. This teaching will not work if it is not consistently put into practice with God's grace and the help of the Holy Spirit. If you never get around to renewing your mind, healing will most probably not come. The bottom line is this, how serious are you? Are you willing to do what it takes to get well? Are you willing to put in the effort that is required to renew your mind? Renewing your mind doesn't happen overnight. This teaching is not a quick fix, but these principles do work. There are thousands of people all over the world who had devastating incurable disease but are well today because of this knowledge and insight. In session 17 I spoke about a faith confession to help you to renew your mind according to who you are in Christ. I've also written one to help you with fear and anxiety. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What is so good about a faith confession, which is basically where you speak out the word, is that you renew your mind three times quicker. That is because you hear what you speak, and that information goes back into your mind through your ears, and it becomes a thought again, which reinforces the memory that you are building. So you are reinforcing in your mind what you are saying. I used this principle in medical school when I used to study large volumes of work. When I used to study, I didn't sit and read quietly. I'd speak it out loud to myself, and I found that I learned the work so much quicker and remembered it better. I've said this previously, and I'll say it again. One of your most powerful weapons to defeat the enemy is to speak out the Word of God. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says that the Word of God is like a two-edged sword. It is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing and effective. The Bible on the shelf is not going to do anything for you. Its power is only released in your life when you speak it in faith. So I'm going to read out this faith confession to you and I encourage you to say it with me. The words will be shown on the screen. Now this faith confession is not something you have to do like a ritual. It is only intended as a guide to help get you started. These are scriptures that you can use in your thinking time to um, start renewing your mind and to break that mental habit of fear and anxiety. So here we go. I loose my mind from fear and anxiety and bind my mind to the mind of Christ. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a calm and well-balanced mind. Father, I cast the whole of my care all of my anxieties, all of my worries, all my concerns, once and for all on you, for you care about me affectionately and you care about me watchfully. Therefore God's peace which surpasses all understanding is guarding my heart and mind. Because I have your peace, I will not let my heart be troubled. I will not allow myself to be agitated and disturbed. I will not permit myself to be fearful, intimidated, cowardly, and unsettled. The fear of man brings a snare, but because I lean on, trust in, and put my confidence in the Lord, I am safe and set on high. Father, I thank you for your promise in Hebrews 13 verse 5, where God himself is said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not, in any degree, leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. So I can take comfort, and be encouraged, and confidently and boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be seized with alarm, I will not fear, or dread, or be terrified. What can man do to me? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear or dream? The Lord is the refuge and stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I fear not. There is nothing to fear. 
for God is with me. I do not look around in terror and be dismayed, for the Lord is my God. He will strengthen and harden me to difficulties. Yes, God will help me. Yes, He will hold me up and retain me with His victorious right hand of rightness and justice. Father, as you commanded me in Joshua 1 verse 9, I am strong, vigorous, and very courageous. I will not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord my God is with me wherever I go. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full-grown, complete love turns fear out of the, the doors and expels every trace of te terror. Therefore, Father, I ask that you would strengthen and reinforce me with mighty power in my inner man by the Holy Spirit, himself indwelling in my innermost being and personality. May Christ dwell and make his permanent home in my heart. May, may I be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love, that I may have the power and, and be strong to apprehend what is the breadth, length, height, and depth of your love, that I may really come to know, practically through experience for myself, the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that I may be filled through all my being with the fullness of God, which is the richest measure of your divine presence, that I may become a body wholly full and flooded with God himself. Father, I ask that you would give me a love for you as no man has had before. I want to know you, Father, progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with you, perceiving and recognizing and understanding you more strongly and clearly. And as I set my mind on you, let me enter your rest. The bottom line is, if you want to get healed from diseases that are a result of fear, anxiety and stress, you have got to renew your mind, which means you need to change your thinking to how God thinks. You need to replace those thoughts of fear with thoughts of love, because love is the antidote to fear. Deuteronomy 10 verse 12 and 13 verse 3 says, What does the Lord your God require of you? To love the Lord your God with all of your mind, with all of your heart, and with your entire being. When the devil drops thoughts of fear into your mind again, and he will try, respond by bringing that thought captive, and interrupt that thought by speaking out the word of God. I said earlier that the best way to stop thinking a toxic thought is to start speaking because you can't think one thing and say another at the same time. So every time the devil drops a thought of fear into your mind, verbalize your love for God. For example, quote the scripture I just mentioned, which is Deuteronomy 12, 10 verse 12. Say, I love you, Lord, with my whole heart, mind, soul and strength. I appreciate, prize, love, and adore you exceedingly. If you do that, every time your thoughts start to get fearful, the devil will soon leave you alone because he can't stand you verbalizing your love for God. It will drive him insane. And you are the God that he is.